Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our Better Academy, our second episode where we will be busting myths regarding e-mobility. In our previous episode, we were exploring the history of electric vehicles and the basic functionings of the lithium-ion batteries. So feel free to browse our YouTube channel as well as the description of this video where you'll find the link to our dedicated web page. And of course, feel free to leave a comment on our social media as your feedback is more than welcome. Today is very special as we will be joined by someone very exceptional, Dr. Andy Palmer, our non-executive vice chairman. Andy brings more than 41 years of experience to Innovat Auto in the field of automotive and other mobility related sectors. Andy has worn and wears many hats, among the most important ones are being the COO of Nissan, where he helped perfect the Nissan Leaf, one of the most sold electric vehicles today. And uh, also, Andy has been the CEO of Aston Martin, you know, the supercar brand with the Bond cars. So without further ado, let's dig in and let's bust myths with Andy Palmer. Andy, it's so nice to see you. Uh, we are thrilled that you could uh, make time in your very busy schedule to be part of our Battery Academy. And uh, we are very excited to hear your explanations on several urban myths that are related to e-mobility. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm, it's my huge pleasure. So uh, some say that uh, electric vehicles are less environmentally friendly than cars with combustion engines. How would you react to that? <laughs> it's always, it always amazes me where, where, where these myths come from. Look, um, an electric car is not zero carbon. That, that's clear. What it is, is it's zero carbon from the tailpipe. But obviously in the manufacturing of the electricity, there's a possibility to, to, to use carbon and, and in the manufacturing of the vehicle, you use carbon, so it's not carbon free. Electric car is not a panacea solution and I don't think anybody um, should see it as that and as the, one of the inventors of the electric car, at least in, in the Nissan Leaf, um, I would never claim that to be the case. However, as a CO2 point of view and as a uh, means of producing that CO2 and reducing the particulate uh, in the urban air, it's a big, big improvement. And that alone is a good enough reason to do it. However, if you look at it uh, from the point of view of a normal mix of energy production, which is gonna be a combination of wind and solar and natural gas and coal and nuclear, when you put that average for most countries, when you compare that well to wheel, an electric car produces uh, significantly less CO2 than let's say a hybrid car. The other thing that an electric car does, of course, is it creates no, no particulate emissions. So if you're looking at uh, cleaning up air uh, in the urban environment, um, if you remove the particulates from the exhaust pipe, then obviously automatically you clean the air. I see, but generally you would say that electric cars are more environmentally friendly than cars with combustion engines. No question, no question about it. So. It's, it's the right thing to do, and it's the right thing to also compare it with energy production from hydrogen, energy production from synthetic fuels, and let those technologies play against each other so that basically you get the best of all worlds, what I call Darwinism. Did you know that Slovakia has a very low carbon energy mix? Almost 80% of our electricity comes from nuclear, from hydro and from renewable resources. This should actually increase to maybe 90-95% in the future as we will be closing one of our coal plants and extending our nuclear capacities. This makes Slovakia suitable for e-mobility from an environmental perspective. Actually, according to the data of the European Federation of Transport and Environment, a mid-range car driven in Slovakia, whose batteries are also produced in Slovakia, would have a 74% lower carbon footprint than its petrol counterpart. This figure changes in France, uh, it's even a bigger carbon emission saving up to 80%, and even in heavily coal-reliant Poland, driving a mid-range electric car would cause 28% lower carbon footprint than driving a petrol car. One has to have really deep pockets when purchasing a car, especially an electric car. But are they really that expensive if you look at them in the long run? So I think the way that you have to look at, at an electric car is in two ways, really. Uh, the first way is it's new technology. And new technology is usually expensive in the, in the first instance. And then as you get mass production, it gets cheaper. Um, it's known as the Moore's Law. Uh, and it's basically, basically the reduction in cost um, over time against volume. You need to look at the total cost of ownership. Look at the battery 
as if it was a perpetually full fuel tank because the cost of charging a battery is quite small, right? So as opposed to what it would cost you to put petrol into your car over its life, add the total costs up. And what you start to see now is that with, with the overall cost of electric cars, you're coming to that crossover point. And historically, the, the industry has said, when we can get batteries down to around about $100 per kilowatt hour, that's more or less the break even point of electric cars versus gasoline cars from a total cost of ownership point of view. And, and you know, uh, 10 years on from the launch of the Leaf, from the launch of the Tesla S, etc., we're getting close to that point. Let's do the math. So generally, my car has an average consumption of 7.3 liters per 100 kilometers. According to current gas prices, this costs me around 9.3 euros per 100 kilometers. How much would the electric alternative cost? An average electric vehicle has a consumption of 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. If I were to charge this electric vehicle on an 80 to 20 ratio of home charging and charging from the infrastructure, 100 kilometers would cost me around 2.8 euros. I drive around 15,000 kilometers a year, which means that this will bring me an annual saving of 990 euros just on fuel. On top of that, electric vehicles have 60% lower maintenance costs compared to petrol cars. This would actually save me another 210 euros. In Slovakia, you have lower registration fees, car insurance and taxes paid for electric vehicles. So this could actually bring me another annual saving of 200 euros. So if I switch, this would bring me a saving of 1,400 euros a year. This annual saving uh, could actually offset the approximately 10,000 to 12,000 euro extra charge I would pay for a version of an electric vehicle for my mid-range car. So after seven to nine years, my electric vehicle would actually be cheaper than the petrol counterpart. And most importantly, we still haven't talked subsidies yet. So actually in Slovakia, there was a period in the end of November 2019 where you could get 8,000 euros for buying an electric vehicle. And there was a 6 million euro allocation and it exactly lasted 3 minutes and 41 seconds until it got depleted. A common fear that hinders EV adoption is safety, especially exploding batteries. How would you react to this concern? You know, uh, you have explosive substance on board a car, whether it's uh, gasoline or hydrogen or battery. So obviously there is always an underlying safety concern and that's why vehicle manufacturers go to enormous lengths to avoid what, what we in the industry usually refer to as thermal incidents. Um, batteries are, are a point in case. What you, do, what you want to avoid with a battery is a thermal runaway. Um, and, and we simulate in the development of vehicles, we simulate that thermal runaway. So for example, there's something known as the nail test, where you essentially push a nail into the cells to, to promote thermal runaway and you have to be able to control that that so you don't get a, a thermal incidence you don't you don't set fire to the vehicle the standards that we use for gasoline and the standards we use for electrics um, are essentially the same the car shouldn't catch fire in, under any circumstances although obviously the test methods are slightly slightly different so on the whole i'm very confident that the basically a battery powered vehicle is at least as safe as a petrol, as a diesel. So uh, others say that uh, EVs are quiet and uh, therefore a danger to pedestrians. So how do regulators and car makers cope with this issue? When we were developing the Nissan LEAF, we had this discussion a lot actually. Uh, above about 15 to 20 kilometers per hour, actually the dominant noise source is the tires. So the tires are the same, whether you're a gasoline car or you're a, or you're a battery car. So you're at higher speeds, it's not something that you have to worry about. The noise is the same. So what we're talking about is low speed. And in most places around the world, legislation demands that you have some form of noise maker. Uh, and the form of noise maker is absolutely there to, to warn cyclists or people with in, impaired uh, hearing. It's actually quite, quite fun because you know, often what you're looking for as a, as a vehicle manufacturer, you're looking for something that gives brand identity. And whilst uh, no doubt cars like an Aston Martin 
have identity in sound. Mo most cars don't. Most cars have a fairly standard sounding engine. So actually an electric car and the sound maker, it actually gives you an opportunity to give a signature. Not, not well exploited yet, but something definitely for the future. Some say that battery capacity varies hugely based on hot or cold weather. So uh, does weather have really such a strong effect on batteries? There are, I would say, four things that, let's say, battery cars dislike. Um, dislike temperature variance, dislike gradient, dislike weight, and dislike aerodynamic drag. The engineers can do something about the, the latter two, but the former, you can't do anything about the extremes of weather. So you have to make it you know, able to cope. And one of the reasons, for example, bat battery electric cars don't much care for uh, temperature extremes is that the consumer, the consumer will be using a heater or an aircon unit, and that obviously draws from the battery. It's a lot more to do with the way that the user is using it. Um, and you know, even if you don't use the, um, the aircon, for example, if you open your windows while you drive, you increase drag. And as I mentioned, drag is, is mm -hmm. one of the four things that batteries dislike. So it, it's, it's, it's more to do with our human interaction with the car than it is to do with, with the batteries themselves. And a big advantage of an electric car is that you can heat it while you're not in it. So set, set your electric car to heat up or cool down half an hour before you get in it well it's still connected to the to the electricity supply so it's not using any of your battery energy and then when you get into your 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 car on a, a minus 20 degree morning you know you're nice and you're nice and warm in the car there is a common misconception that batteries cannot be recycled could you shed more light on this batteries uh, I would <laughs> they're interesting I think they can recycle recycled I would say they can have three lives almost. So let's say life number one is in a is in the car, and life number one, the battery will will last the life of your car, and perhaps over the life of the car, um, its charge capacity will reduce by twenty or thirty percent, depending on how long you you keep it. So at the end of life, actually the battery is still useful, and that's where we talk about second life and second life batteries are really interesting because they still have that 70 or 80% capacity. So really useful, for example, on a wind farm where, where basically the wind is blowing at night, the grid isn't able to use it, so you store the energy in the battery. Or we all have batteries in our houses so that, again, we can, we can make the most of charging the battery up on cheap electricity overnight and discharging it to, to power the house during the day. So that's an example of Second Life. And then third life, third life, you can shred the battery. Um, so you can recycle the battery. And I think one of the really interesting areas that Inabad is working on is that recycling. Uh, and you recycle it, um, you, you create the, the, the powder basically, and that powder goes back into your new battery. So you very much fall into this, um, what I'd like to call C to C or cradle to cradle technology, the circular economy in another in another way. I have heard that a lot of people think that the rise of e-mobility will cause outages as our grid and energy production won't be able to keep up. Should we be preparing for blackouts? I don't think so. I mean, look, there's undoubtedly a question to be had to make sure that you've got balance. But remember that the, the, the concept is, is generally that the, the cars charge during the night and the discharge during the day. I'm going to give you an anecdote. When I was developing and we just launched the Nissan Leaf in Japan, there was the, the famous and terrible uh, great earthquake and tsunami. And what shocked me most during that wasn't the earthquake itself or it even wasn't the tsunami, but it was basically people dying afterwards in hospitals. Because as you know, the tsunami took out most of the uh, Fukushima um, nuclear plant and a lot of the other plants had to close down and so there were blackouts and people were losing their lives in, in hospitals as a result of basically losing power and that struck me as tragic and we had a concept in the laboratories um, basically of something called leaf to home and it was the ability to send the electricity in the other direction so that you could power your home or more importantly power your hospital so that ability to think about 
uh, electric cars as a storage of energy to be given back to the grid when it's appropriate, I think needs to be part of our planning. Uh, and, and that way, you know, I don't think that we're going to need to build lots more nuclear reactant plants around the world. I think we, we just need to right size it and make sure that we live in a, again, I'm going to use the expression of C to C, cradle to cradle uh, uh, economy, where, where, you know, you're not just taking, but you're also giving back. Battery grids will also be have to upgrade in Slovakia, but this can be done through different methods and battery management systems. Just for a better understanding of how much car charging consumes, well, slow chargers equal to an electric output of an electric kettle. And a faster domestic charger, which has around 7 kilowatts of charging capacity, which could charge actually your car in your 8 hours sleep for around 280 kilometers, well, this equals the energy output of a slightly larger dishwasher and air conditioning. So, and will the Slovak grid collapse if we have electric vehicles? According to the most optimistic scenario, we should have around 140,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2030. The average Slovak drives around 12,000 kilometers per year, and let's take that an average car consumes around 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. This means that on average, one electric vehicle would be consuming around 2.4 megawatts per year. And this all totals at an astonishing 336 gigawatt hours per year. But how much is that? Well, it's actually 1.1% of the total energy consumption of Slovakia. And remember, this was the most optimistic scenario. So according to the most pessimistic scenario, we should have only 35,000 electric vehicles on the roads by 2030. So I hope that this answers your question on whether uh, Slovakia's electricity grid will collapse because of electric mobility. And the people tend to have a more narrow view on e-mobility. So in a sense that it only involves passenger cars. So what else is there to e-mobility? Well, e-mobility is end-to-end is -end almost. I mean, we talk about it, cars, because people can focus on cars because they understand how a car impacts on their lives. But one of the biggest growth fields over the next five to 10 years is actually what's called the last one mile. And the last one mile can be the people that uh, deliver your groceries to your door, the Amazons of the world, the FedExes of the world. Um, and of course, that naturally is moving in an electric direction. Um, it can be you in your last one mile, which is, you know, maybe you take a, uh, an electric bike, maybe you take an electric scooter, maybe you'll use a bus more or an electric taxi. And then beyond that, um, you may see uh, electric, what you and I might call helicopters, what sometimes is called an electric car, um, but it's short range air travel. As you go to heavier vehicles, um, you're probably going to see more use of hydrogen uh, and it may well come in the form of fuel cells. And if you think about aviation, long, long range aviation, and you think perhaps even supercars where you still want the thrill of the sound, then you might look to um, synthetic fuels. I think there are 13 or 15 ships in the world that produce more sulfur content in the air than all of the cars in the world altogether. So solving some of the, the emissions from shipping uh, has an enormous effect on, on air pollution and CO2. So the interesting thing in, in all of those cases, you still need a battery. Uh, and of course, that, that's what makes it really interesting for companies like Inabat, because wh whether you're, you're a hybrid car with synthetic fuel, whether you're uh, storing energy from a fuel cell, or whether you're storing energy from, from an electric source, you need a battery. It's, it's everywhere. Our whole life, the way that we move is going to be changed by electrical power. and it was a real pleasure uh, having you. Very good. Anyway, guys, stay safe, stay negative. Have a good evening. This is all from my side regarding e-mobility related myth busting. So thank you very much for your attention. In the next episode, we will be digging deeper into batteries, what they contain and what's their chemistry. We'll be doing this with our head of science, Jakub Reiter, who has vast experience from BMW. So I hope you're as thrilled for the next episode as much as I am. Thank you very much for watching and don't forget to follow us on social media and have a nice day.